we see here in these verses where God tells Moses, again, Aaron's descendants, they will inherit this position and it will stay throughout the Mosaic age. And so then as we go on through the chapter, it just, it talks about, it gives a lot of details, which again, we're not going to get involved with, but details about the different offerings that have to be made in this consecration ceremony. So in verses uh, 10 through 14, you have the sin offering, and that was with the bullock. And again, it gives details about how it was to be done. Then verses 15 through 18, you have the burnt offering. And that was, we said a minute ago, you had to have two rams. So the burnt offering, this was the first ram. Okay, so the sin offering was the bullet. The burnt offering was this the first ram. So again, this is going to be a deep, it's a very detailed ceremony. It's going to take a while to go through this. Two rams, one for the sin offering and one for the fire. Well, the, the, the sin offering is going to be the bullock. Okay, so and then the burnt, rams. yeah, there's one bullock and there's two rams. Okay. Okay. So sin offering is the bullock and then the burnt offering is going to be the first ram. And then in verses 19 through 30, here we have the, the sacrifice of the second ram. And this is called the Ram of Consecration. Okay, the Ram of Consecration is what this one is called. And so we do want to note, Paul's here for a second, note something about this one. It's very interesting. So they, it talks about all through here about the, what do you do with the blood when you sacrifice them, you put it on the altar. It talks about all these kind of details. But something really interesting about this one, this is the ram of consecration. Moses is to take the blood from this ram, ram of consecration. And he's supposed to take a little bit of that blood and sprinkle, put, put some on Aaron's right ear. Not both ears, just the right ear. And then he's supposed to put some on Aaron's right thumb and then some on Aaron's big right toe. So again, God's very specific. Okay, now it's not thoroughly explained. You go, okay, well, what's that for? But scholars seem to think that, and it, it makes sense, say, well, this was, putting that on, it's, it's demonstrated, it's, it's symbolic of that Aaron and the other priests, they're going to hear God's word. They're going to listen to it, right? The thumb means they're going to be working for God. They're going to be doing with their hands what they're supposed to be doing. And then the toe would represent you're going to walk in the faith. You're going to walk in God's path. So it seems like that, that's probably a pretty good explanation. These garments that Aaron is wearing here said they're, they're going to be passed down. So when Aaron's time is up and his sons come in and their sons and their sons, the garments will be passed down. Won't they get kind of worn out? I mean, they should, shouldn't they? Yeah, God won't let that happen, right? What about all the regular clothes the Israelites are wearing? They don't wear it because they're going to wear the same outfit for 40 years. Right, so but they don't wear out. So that's another miracle of God. But so these garments are to be passed down for centuries uh, through the priesthood. Then in verses uh, 31 through 34, God tells them that only Aaron and his sons, only the priests, can eat the ram of consecration. Nobody else is allowed to eat it. And whatever they didn't eat, if they didn't eat all of it, they were still supposed to burn the left. So they, they were the only ones that were allowed to eat that. And then 
verses 33 through 37, it just tells us that this ceremony, this consecration ceremony, which again, they're not actually doing it yet. God's just telling them how to do it. It will take seven days. So this will take a week to do this. And every day they had to make those offerings. The bullock, the altar was to be cleaned and anointed. So this was a seven-day ceremony before Aaron and his sons would be considered sanctified to actually go in and offer worship up to the Lord. And at the end of the chapter, it talks about daily sacrifices. Had to be made every day, two lambs had to be sacrificed. And God concludes here, he promises the Israelites that he will be with them in the tabernacle. So again, it's just there's a lot of details in there, but we're not under that system anymore, so it's not something that, oh, we have to memorize all these things, but we just want to know that God is exact, he's very specific, and he wants things done the way he wants things done. And that applies to us just as much as it did to them. We don't have to do the sacrifices and all those things anymore, but we need to do everything that we're commanded to do to be pleasing to God. All right, so then we get to chapter 30. And so the first 10 verses talk about what is known as the altar of incense. Okay, and again, God is very specific about how this thing is to be built, how it's to be used. So remember, in the tabernacle, there's two rooms. What are they called? Holy place and the most holy. Yeah, the holy place and the most holy place, right? So the altar of incense was to be put in the holy place. And God said, He told them where to put it. He wants it right next to the veil that leads to the most holy place. So they weren't allowed just to put it just anywhere in that room. God told them specifically, this, it goes right here. And so this is where Aaron was instructed to burn incense daily, twice, once in the morning, once in the evening. And this was not an altar of sacrifice. We already talked about the brazen altar. That was where they sacrificed the animals. This was strictly for burning incense. No animals were to be sacrificed on this altar. Now they did. Once a year, they would take blood from the sacrifice animals. They would sprinkle this altar with the blood of the animals. Uh, but no animals were to be sacrificed on it. And God was very specific and said, we're going to see in a minute here, hopefully, God is going to tell them how to make the incense. And he tells them, that better be the only incense that you use. No unauthorized burning is to take place here. And a couple of guys are going to find that out. Who would that be? They have, have in the Bible. They're going to learn that lesson. <clears throat> unauthorized fire, fire which God commanded not. You're using stuff I didn't tell you to use. You said, well, incense is incense. What difference does it make? It makes a difference to God. And he's going to specify this is how you make it. This is the kind you are to use. Aaron was to burn it on that altar. All right, and then verses 11 through 16 talks about uh, atonement money. This was a, a tax where God said all the men age 20 and above, they all had to pay uh, this tax of one half shekel. And everybody paid the same. Rich, poor, didn't matter. God was showing everybody is the same in his sight. They have the same worth to God. The 
for us, again, the gospel saves everyone. Rich, poor, doesn't matter. The gospel is open to everyone. Now, what do you think? What are they going to use this money for? Can they use it for whatever they want? Or do you think God tells them what to use it for? Again, with our theme, but very specific, right? What do you think they'll use it for? What's this money? What are they going to... People are, well, yeah, I, I never got it because why do we contribute? God doesn't need money. Well, you're right. God doesn't need money. So what are they going to use it for? Yeah. They're getting ready to build something. They're going to use it to build the tabernacle. Okay? And that, remember, the Egyptians gave them all this wealth when they left, and they apparently took some from the Amalekites. So that was in God's plan all along. So it's going to be used for the construction of the tabernacle. What about our contribution today? People say, well, God doesn't need money anymore. I know he doesn't, but so why do we contribute? Yeah, so humans need money to do the things that God has told us to do. Yeah, a dollar bill doesn't mean anything to God, but we have to have money to spread the gospel to do the things that God told us to do. So that's why we have to do the contribution. Well, in this case, it was... God wants them to build the tabernacle. That's what the wealth is to be used for. Okay? Because yes, God doesn't need money. He's not going to go to the Dollar General store and buy anything. Money is useless to God. But we have to use it to do the things that God wants us to do. All right, in verses 17 through 21, we see, again, more instructions about building something called the laver. What is this? Well, describing it in our terms, it's almost like a bird bath. I mean, it's a little container and it's got water in it. And what do you think that was used for? for yeah, for the priests, like I said, they've got to wash, they've got to be clean. They were to go to the labor and use that water to cleanse themselves before they offered up worship to God. So Aaron had to use it, all the, his sons had to use it, all the priests would use it, and they were commanded to wash their hands and their feet in this water in the lake. Okay, and they put this, God told them to put this in the outer court, because again, you want to be clean before you go into the tabernacle. So this was in the outer court between the brazen altar and the uh, tabernacle entrance. Again, God very specific. He wants it in a, an exact spot. He didn't tell Moses, well, oh, just I don't care, put it wherever you want. He told Moses exactly where it was to go. All the furniture is going to be specified. This goes here and that goes over there. Verses 22 through 33. Here we have where God talks about this spoil. That Aaron and, and his sons, had, they had to be anointed with this oil. And so God gives Moses here in these verses the recipe this is how you make this oil. I don't want you using just any oil. It's got to be just exactly this. So he's given the recipe. He's given the mixture. This is how you make this. Would any other kind of oil be acceptable to God? Nope, because this is what he wanted. Well, oil is oil. No, it isn't. Not according to God. So he told Moses, he said, this oil, once you mix it properly, this is to be, I want this on everything. So God told him to put it on the tabernacle. He is to put it on every piece of furniture in the tabernacle. And he is to put it on the priest, Aaron and his sons. Okay, and the idea was to purify, to sanctify. That's what the oil was for. And God then further tells Moses that no one 
is allowed to use this oil for just everyday, ordinary purposes. Hey, that'd be a great skin moisturizer. I think I'll, uh uh. God said, you only use it for what I tell you to use it for. There are other oils you can use for other everyday purposes, not this. And he said, anybody that does, kick them out. They were to be cast out of the camp, they're to be banished. Anybody that uses this oil for personal purposes, inappropriate what? Okay, then the last verses in the chapter, he same thing. He talks about the incense, he gives the recipe. Just any incense won't do. You've got to mix it exactly the way God told him to mix it. And again, God warns Moses, this is not to be used for any other purpose except what I've told you to use it for. And anyone who does, same penalty. You kick them out of the camp, they're to be banished. So again, the idea for us, how this is applicable to us, is as we go through the New Testament, we are told how to conduct worship services. How does God describe it? Do all things decently and in order, right? And we are given instructions. So are we allowed to alter those instructions? No. Again, we, well, God said on the first day of the week we are to do the Lord's Supper. Well, let's just do that quarterly. Did God say to do it quarterly? No, he did not. So we, we don't have the authority any more than Moses did. Moses and Aaron didn't get to vote on any of this. It's not a democracy. It's a monarchy, and God's the king. He said, this is the way I want this done. So New Testament worship, we have to do it exactly the way God told us to do it. Let's go to chapter 31. So here God tells Moses that he has chosen two men. And I'll probably butcher the names. Uh, Bezalel and Aholiab. Necessarily need to know them, but but God did. He specifically picked out these two men and told Moses that they are going to be in charge of everything to do with building the tabernacle. So this is not Moses is not in charge of this. God says, "I pick these two men. I will give them the skills they need, and they are to be in charge of all this." We don't know much about these men other than God picked them for this specific purpose and, and again he said he would give them the skills they needed. Uh, and so that they were like the general contractor or whatever. They were overseeing all the construction and it was told, you know, you need to do what they tell you to do when you're, when you're constructing this. They are in charge because God put them in charge. They were told how to build all the furniture, how to make the garments, I mean everything to do with this. The oil, the incense, they were the guys that were in charge. BJ, can you me repeat something? Just the name of the two guys. Oh, you need me to spell those for you or did you find I had it. Okay. It was in the header of my chapter. Thank you. <laughs> So verses 12 through 17, we see here, and they're talking about the, the priesthood, talking about building tabernacles, and then God says here, he again emphasizes that they are to keep the Sabbath. So in the middle of all this other stuff, he says, oh, and by the way, you are still, you are to observe the Sabbath. Which, as we've already said, they were to keep that until when? Christ did. Until Jesus is nailed to the cross. Okay. 
So the, a key thing that we need to understand about this, because God does several times through these last few chapters, he's going to keep emphasizing this, keep the Sabbath holy. But we noticed it's not in the New Testament, right? It's the only commandment that's not read or stated in some shape, form, or fashion. So we need to understand that this idea, this was a covenant. The Sabbath was a covenant between God and Israel. Okay? It was a covenant between God and Israel. What was it not? It was not a covenant between God and the Gentiles, nor was it a covenant between God and modern-day Christians. It was that place, that time, that people. Okay? But God does continually emphasize it with them. You better make sure that you keep the Sabbath holy. Okay, we saw Acts 20 and 7. We are to worship not on the Sabbath, but the first day of the week. Not the last day of the week, but the first day of the week. Okay. So it's probable here that why would God insert this in the middle of all these instructions about you're going to build this, you're going to do this. And probably God is wanting them to make sure they understand the Sabbath is not to be violated for any reason. And that includes building the tabernacle. So what does that mean? They rest. Yeah. You can work six days. You need to work hard for six days. On that seventh day, well, but, but we're doing a holy thing. We're building a place to worship God. That makes it okay, right? No. God said no. Nothing is an excuse to violate the Sabbath, even building the tabernacle. You take that day off. Okay? And God was so serious about that that he said anybody that violates this, anybody that works on the Sabbath, even if they're building the tabernacle, they are to be executed. That's a death penalty offense. And it's not a death penalty offense for us today, but does God expect us to not neglect the worship service? It's a death sentence in a way. In what way? Spiritual death sentence. If I neglect church services and I voluntarily don't go, I will lose my soul for that. But God takes that very seriously, and he expects us to take worshiping him just as seriously as he expected them. And then we see here in the last verse. And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the fingers of God. So this is where he gives Moses the two tablets with the Ten Commandments. We noted earlier written on front and back. But Moses didn't carve them in there. God did. Sorry, what? That last point you had, yeah, yes. it was seeing what was the right verses. Sorry, I was finishing. Uh, that was just verse 18, the last okay. verse of the chapter. Okay. Mm -hmm. Where God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. All right, chapter 32. So now we're going to see in these next three chapters, 32, 33, 34, we see the record of the apostasy of while Moses is on Mount Sinai. And we talked about that. How long was he there? 40 days, 40 nights, yeah. And so while Moses is on Mount Sinai speaking with God, Something's going on down in the camp. And it ain't good. 
So the people become a little bit restless. They get a little impatient. Man, what, where's Moses at? Well, he's been gone for a long time. They're not realizing that Moses is on whose schedule? God's. God's, not theirs, not his own. He's on God's schedule. Right? But they're wondering, well, I wonder whatever happened to Moses. What do you think happened to him? He's still up there talking with God. That's what happened to him. But they get impatient. They get restless. What happened to Moses, the man that brought us out of the land of Egypt? We don't know what's become of him. See there in verse 1. Let's just read this part. And Aaron said unto them, Let's go back. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what is become of him. So they want Aaron to make them gods. So what should have happened right there? You didn't say no. Yeah. Aaron should have said, have you lost your minds? You want me to make you gods who they didn't bring us out of Egypt. The one true God brought us out of Egypt. My brother's up there talking to him right now. And you want me to do this? You are out of your mind. I'm not doing this. I'm not going to go against God. That's what Aaron should have done. But he does. Maybe he was intimidated by the crowd. I don't know. But, you know, God's bigger and more powerful than the crowd. Didn't nobody or, have guts to touch the mountain, though. I know. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> and they can still see, you know, the rumblings are up there. And Moses is up there. It's like, Really? Man. But Aaron should have said, no, we're not doing this. And if they forcibly did it, well, at least Aaron would go, well, I'm not going to have anything to do with this. You guys do what you want. But he doesn't do that. And Aaron said unto them, break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters, bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings, which are in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. Now here's key. Look at verse 4. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. How quickly they forget. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. So he didn't stop there. Got the golden calf. Well, we need an altar. Might as well build that too. And Aaron made proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast of the Lord. Like this is going to be the God we want to worship. So he proclaims that, that this is good and right. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. And in verse 7, the Lord said unto Moses, get, Go, get thee down for thy people, which thou brought us out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. So obviously God is not pleased with this. So the people had been restless. They asked Aaron to make a God. He agrees to do it. He makes an altar. Then he proclaims that this is righteous. This is good. So now since Aaron was the high priest, and he claimed that this was acceptable worship, did that make it acceptable? Why not? He's the high priest. Yeah, he's not God. Right? So as great as the high priest might be among men, he's not God. You can't overrule God or change God. So just because he said it was acceptable, that doesn't make it true. What about many so-called religious leaders today who tell us, Things that aren't in the Bible are okay with God. True or false? That's false. Okay? You, I, none of us has any authority to alter anything that God told us to do. But so many people do that today. 
And so they think God, a lot of these people today, they think God is obligated to accept their worship no matter what it is because I'm worshiping God. In my mind, I'm worshiping God. Therefore, God has to accept it. Says who? Yeah. How dare I tell God what he has to accept? Well, God, I know you told me to worship you in this fashion, but I think this would be better and you better like it. The arrogance. <clears throat> but that's the mindset they have. Well, you know, I, as long as I'm worshiping God any old way, God will accept it. Again, the idea that we're seeing in these chapters right through here is God is specific, He is exact. He doesn't leave a lot of stuff up to our, well, you guys just do whatever you want to do. And again, we go all the way back to the beginning. You don't have to go far to see somebody offer their own worship. Just ask Cain. How'd that go? Like Dr. Field say, how's that working out for you? Cain would say, yeah, that didn't go real well. Because Cain decided to offer what he thought was acceptable and God wouldn't take it. So Cain worshipped God, but it was vain worship. It was unacceptable worship. There is such a thing. But you have a lot of people today that, well, just whatever you offer, it's fine. But that's not what we see anywhere, really, in the Bible. But we're really seeing that here in Exodus and Leviticus. That's not the way God is. All right, then verses 7 through 14. God is so angry about this. Does he have a right to be? Yeah. Well, I can't believe he got so mad. Well, believe it. God was so angry, he plans to destroy them all. Well, remember, he had made a promise to Abraham that they were going to flourish and you know, everybody's going to be blessed through them. And well, so God says, I'm going to destroy all of them, and I will offer my blessings through the descendants of Moses instead. Because he's so mad that they have done this, rightfully so. And so in a sense, this might have been a kind of test for Moses. Like, you're going to, yeah, Lord, that's a good idea. Why don't you do that? Why don't you bless my family? But Moses doesn't do that. So he could have sold everybody else out and said, yeah, well, why don't we just do that? But instead, Moses passed on that and pleaded with God to show mercy. And remember, Moses hasn't seen yet what they're doing. <clears throat> God has just told them they've corrupted themselves. So Moses probably, well, I wonder what it is they've done. You know, so he's maybe not sure what they've done, but he knows that God's really upset about it, whatever it is. But he pleads with God, saying, look, you've already done so much. You brought us out of Egypt. Do you want the Egyptians to say that you released us from them just so you could kill us out here? Because that's what they'll say. And he mentioned the promise to Abraham. He says, you don't want to switch that over to me. You made that promise to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. And so notice in verse 14, And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. What does that mean? He changed his mind. He changed his mind. Is that the same kind of repentance that you and I are commanded to have? Is that what it means for me, repentance? I just changed my mind. Repentance is because I've sinned. God hasn't sinned. He doesn't repent in that sense. But like J.W., it's just God is willing to change his mind based on the behavior of people and change his actions. And change his actions because he's God. He can do that. Right? So, and again, it's, well, he was going to bring evil. God was going to do evil. It means God was going to punish them for their wickedness. So he was going to bring their wickedness upon them. Right? But Moses pleads on their behalf and so God changes his mind and says, okay, 
Moses is able to convince God to have mercy on them. So then in verses 15 through 29, Moses comes down from Mount Sinai. Bless their heart. Oh. <laughs> and bless his heart too. I can just imagine. So Moses comes down from the mount. Now somewhere on the mount was Joshua. Apparently he didn't go all the way up, but he had gone part of the way and God had apparently told Moses to bring him part of the way. So on the way down, Moses gets Joshua, and Joshua can hear says, something's going on down there. I don't know what it is. So then they continue down the mountain. So Joshua had not been with Moses with God, but he wasn't in the camp either. So he was somewhere on there. And so Moses gets back, and he sees what they're doing. They've got to go with the calf and they are dancing and partying and everybody's taking their clothes off and I mean it's just debauchery. And so Moses was very calm. Oh well that's lovely. <laughs> no wait a minute, that's not what the Bible says is it? Moses was livid just like God was. Now Moses is going, okay, now I know why you're upset. Wasn't sure what they were doing, but yeah, this is awful. Moses is so mad. What does he do? Yeah, he throws and breaks the Ten Commandments, the stone tablets that God had just given him. And as we said earlier, there is no record anywhere of God rebuking Moses for this. He'll just we'll see later. He'll just make another set of tablets. But, but he basically, you're not worthy to receive God's law. You are, can't believe what you've done. So, if it were you or I, you know, you see what's going on and you get mad and you get this out. Well, Christians aren't allowed to get mad. No, there's such a thing as righteous anger. Yes, sometimes it is sinful to get mad. We lose our temper and just totally blow our cool. But remember, Jesus overthrew the money changers' table. He, this, and he fashioned a whip. Now, we don't know if he actually used it or just threatened them with it. Jesus was always as peaceful as a lamb. Not always. Right? Well, they were desecrating the temple of God. He was livid too. So there is such a thing as righteous anger. We see people doing things that are contrary to God's will. We have a right to get angry about that. And so Moses is furious. And so you and me, if this were us, you know, you see what's going on, and you're trying to figure out how in the world could this happen? What would you do? What would be the first thing you, you're trying to fit this, you know, piece this puzzle together? How could this have happened? What would you do? Where would you go? What had Moses done when he left? He went up on the mountain. They said, y'all do whatever you want, or did he leave somebody in charge? Aaron and her. Aaron and her were in charge. So wouldn't you go to them? Right? So like if you own a business today, and you, you go on vacation for a week, and you come back, and everything's falling apart, whoever your manager was, you left in charge, that's who you're going to, hey, what in the world? What's going on here, right? So Moses confronts Aaron. Can you explain this to me? I left you in charge. Everything was fine when I left, and now it's I can't tell the difference between them and the Egyptians or anybody else. And yeah, it's been 40 days, but it's not like it's been 40 years. I haven't been gone that long for them to so completely forget God. How could you let this happen? So what do you think Aaron will say? Will he accept responsibility? Oh. No, 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 no. No, so he's going to blame the people. So in verse 21, Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? And Aaron said, Let
Let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief. Well, that's all their fault. And, of course, they deserve a lot of the blame. But is Aaron blameless? Why didn't you stop it? You not, only, not only did you not stop it, you helped them out. You did what they asked you to do. Right? So Aaron's going to try to pass the buck. Well, you know how people are. And it's crazy. So he does not want to take responsibility for this at all. And so what does Moses do with the uh, the gold, with the calf? Anybody know what he does with it? Yeah, he melts it down, puts the gold dust in the water, makes everybody drink it. Here's your God, you're going to drink this. See that in verse 20. Now, but I want to notice something else about Aaron. Look at verse 24 again when Aaron's trying to justify himself. And I said to them, Whosoever had the gold, let them break it off. So they gave it me. Then I cast it into the fire, and there came out this calf. I, I didn't make it. just came out. It's a miracle. Remember verse 4? And fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. He seems to have forgotten all about that part. It was her fault. He's not. Yeah, where's her in all this? Well, yeah, so he's. Uh, the calf just showed up. I can only imagine Moses, you know, my brother <laughs> telling me that. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you really want me to buy that one? That's the best you can come up with? It just popped out? No, Aaron made the calf. He fashioned it himself. It didn't just make itself. So again, we saw the people were naked. Sexual immorality usually does accompany idol worship. They usually go hand in hand. So then Moses asked, who's on God's side? The Levites come to him and they are commanded to go through the camp and kill people for their transgression. And it says that they killed about 3,000 people. And we're not told who did, you know, how did they decide who they were going to kill? I have no idea. It doesn't tell us, but we just know they killed about 3,000 people. This was the price for their disobedience. And now God's not going to physically kill us today, but we suffer spiritual death if we are disobedient to him and we die in that condition. So Moses tells them that they've all sinned, but he says, I'm going to still yet appeal to God on your behalf. And Moses asked God again to forgive them. So God answers and says, well... Up to a point he will, but they're going to be punished for what they've done, for the sins, for this transgression. So what did he do to them collectively? What were they not allowed to do? Enter, yeah, they're not going to be allowed to enter the land of Canaan. So he said all those age 20 and above will not be allowed to enter Canaan. They will perish during the next you know, 39 years or whatever in the wilderness. They will all die and they will not see the promised land because of what they've done here. But God tells Moses, keep on going to Canaan. The angel, who says Christ, he will continue to guide you. Alright, so verses 1 through 6 of chapter 33, Israel repents.
God still says he will send his angel to lead them. The Canaanites will still be under their power. They will drive the Canaanites out when they get there. But God tells them, my presence will not be with you because of what you've done. You are stubborn. You are rebellious. What's the word that often appears? Stiff necked. Stiff necked. Yeah, which stubborn, rebellious, do what? And uncircumcised and hardened. Yeah. <laughs> so God says, My presence will not be with you. The angel will guide you. You will still go to Canaan. You will still conquer them, but I'm not going to be with you the way I have been with you. Because God says they you've broken the covenant, or they've broken. Well, when the Israelites heard this, they, they go into deep mourning as well they should. So then we see in verses 7 through 11, because they've broken the covenant, construction on the tabernacle is going to be halted. And so Moses has to build, he has to erect a temporary tent. It will be outside the camp, or the tabernacle would have been inside the camp. So Moses puts up this temporary tent, but it's outside the camp. And again, that's symbolic. God was going to be among us, and now you have separated yourself from God. He's going to be outside the camp. But there Moses could still go to commune with God, but it was outside the camp. And it talks about how they would watch Moses as he would enter the tent. They would be very anxious about it. And when they would see the pillar of God come down to the tent, they would bow down and worship. So, something interesting you see here uh, in verse 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. Does that mean literal face to face? No. Well, it's not literal, but it means that God spoke to Moses directly. Because as we'll see later, Moses is going to ask to see God and God tells him, nobody can see my face literally. You can't do it. Um, and something else interesting here says he, he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle or out of this temporary tent. So notice here when God, uh, or when Moses is talking to God at this point, he doesn't take Aaron with him, he takes Joshua with him. Why? Aaron had sinned, Aaron had sinned big time. So that's, that's interesting. So you think Aaron would go with him, but not at this point. He's taking Joshua. Because remember, Joshua hadn't been in the camp. He hadn't committed any sin. He was part of the way up the mountain with uh, Moses. And so we see here in 12 through 23, Moses again meets with God. Again, he intercedes with God. He pleads with God, saying that I don't even want to entertain him, God, if you're not going to be with us. We want your presence. We need you with us. And he tells God, your presence, that's what separates us from the other nations. That's what makes us distinct. And so God agrees to his request. Moses begs him to, to be with them. And so God says, okay, my presence will go with you. So God being very merciful. And so because Moses interceded on their behalf and they repented, they were reconciled unto God. Now who intercedes for us? Jesus. Jesus. You know, we see that. We'll take the time to read it, but Romans 8, 34, Jesus, he makes intercession for us. We're not fit to do it ourselves. So Jesus intercedes for us. That's how we can obtain the grace of God, the mercy of God. So this is where uh, what I was just talking about. Moses asked God if he could see him, but no man can see God and live. But God allows Moses to see some kind of manifestation. We don't know exactly what that looked like. 
So it's kind of pointless to speculate, but God allowed Moses to see something, but it wasn't the face of God. He couldn't see that. Okay. Let's do one more. One more. I think we can. This one's pretty short, too. We'll be almost caught up. All right, verses 1 through 9 in chapter 34. This is where God tells Moses to make two more stone tablets because he destroyed the first ones, rightfully so. So he says, Get, bring two more stone tablets, bring them back up to Mount Sinai, and God tells Moses he will write the Ten Commandments on them again. So Moses isn't going to carve these either. Both times God will write it himself. Same thing as last time. God says, make sure everybody else stays away from the mountain. And so God tells Moses, look, uh, he, he is merciful, but he will not overlook sin. And so he's saying the descendants of these people, they are going to suffer the consequences for what these people do because of their hardness. sin. <laughs> So then in verses 10 through 26, here God renews his covenant with them because they have repented. Moses has interceded on their behalf. And God promises them more miracles. He will use miracles to help them in the future like he did with the Red Sea. And if you continue reading through the Bible, you will see those like, you know, when they come to Canaan, they got to cross the Jordan River. How do they do that? It drives up. Yeah, like the Red Sea. A lot of people, they always think about the Red Sea. They think the Jordan River you drive that up for them, too, so they could cross into Canaan. Uh, so they'll see that. Uh, the walls of Jericho are going to fall. You know, so there's going to be some other things that they will see. And God promises them he will do things like that for them. That's the good news. Now, God gives them a very strong warning about when they get to Canaan. He said, when you get there, you are not to really have anything to do with the Canaanites, the people that live there. You're going to conquer them and you're going to take it, but do not live with them. You are not to make a covenant because God considered that a covenant. You live with them, you're making a covenant with them. And you cannot do that. So he tells the Israelites, he said, whenever you come across their idols, their religious symbols, you are to destroy them. Don't just ignore them. Well, hey, I didn't worship it, so it's okay. God, no, I want you to tear them down. There shouldn't be anything left of their religion when you get there. Do not worship their gods. Do not have relations with them. Do not intermarry with them. So it's a good thing that the Israelites, they will follow those commands, right? Wrong. Yeah. They're going to do exactly what God tells them here not to do. Israel will violate this again, again, again. And every time they do, it pulls them away from God, which is why God told them not to do it. Because he knew it would pull them away from him, and, and it does every time. Every time it leads to disaster. And God tells them to, like Aaron did with the calf, he said, oh, by the way, after you tear these down, don't you make any of these either. Why can we not make uh, statues or, or things like that to God? I'm not talking about to false gods. Why can't we make one to Him? We don't, we don't know what it looks like. Right? And if God had wanted that, wouldn't He have commanded it? He would have told us to do it, right? But if we don't know what He looks like, well, then what's 
the statute supposed to look like? Right? So God said, don't make any of these things yourselves. And again, God commands them, keep the feast days, keep the Sabbath. You know, he reiterates that again. Then verses 27 through 40, or 35, Moses, the second time, again, he's on Mount Sinai for 40 days, 40 nights. And we already said he fasted while he was there. God again writes the Ten Commandments for him on these new stone tablets. And it says that Moses wrote the other, all the other instructions that God had given him. It says Moses wrote in a book, which would be the books we're reading here, Exodus, Leviticus. Okay, now something kind of interesting here when they, when God, oh, sorry, when Moses comes down from the mountain, being in the presence of God, now his face is glowing. And so this scared everybody to death. And so Moses started wearing the veil, except when he talked to God. He didn't take the veil off. But so when he's around the Israelites, he'd wear this veil. And if you look in, we're not going to take the time to read it because I'm time is short. 2 Corinthians 3, verses 13 through 16. It, apparently that kind of represents this idea of blindness to the truth that many people have. If you read those verses, you'll, you'll see where it talks about Moses. Talks about the veil that he wore. They were blinded. You know, they, they, want, they want to go back to the old law. And they're blinded by that. Okay. Any questions, comments? Okay. So what we'll do next week? No, it's a lot. Thank y'all very much. Uh, verses 35 through 40, we'll finish up. We were supposed to get through that tonight, but we made up a lot of ground, so we're pretty close. We can go through those very quickly because it's really, it chronicles the building of the tabernacle. And again, it's not necessary that we know all of those details, so we're just going to put out, kind of point out the main idea of each of those last six chapters. Uh, and then, so Lord willing, we should be able to start the book of Leviticus next week. So, thank you all for coming. Hope you have a great night.